Good morning, Grace St. Paul's. Is my juice okay there, James? I'm okay going out and good morning, live stream folks. Welcome, welcome, welcome. A uh, <clears throat> few announcements for you, actually not announcements, I'm just going to point you to things. So uh, I wanted to let you know that our giving and receiving team is in place and uh, that's really, really exciting. And uh, here at Grace St. Paul's, we don't use the S word, stewardship. We call it giving and receiving uh, for reasons that you've heard from the pulpit. So uh, our giving and receiving group is together. Uh, Dorothy Irvine is chairing our committee this year, and we've got lots of folks that have helped us in the past, like John and Laurie Cam and Kim Braun and, and other folks. But read the bulletin, and you'll find out who's on the committee and what we're doing. And, uh, and I'm, I'm just thankful to, to all of those folks who are going to be in the middle of that, and thankful to all of you for keeping us going in the middle of COVID. Um, this, you guys have just been unbelievable and I can't thank you enough for that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And then on page 28, there's a story called the Post COVID Church. And that's about our new marketing campaign here at Grace St. Paul's, where we're gonna be looking out uh, to the whole nation and, uh, and start thinking of Grace St. Paul's as more than just a church to, uh, to Tucson in this community. And the reason we're doing that is because what I've heard the very most over the last five or six years is we need to get this message out to way more people. So that's exactly what we're gonna, what we're gonna be working on doing. So, uh, so you can read about, uh, about that and how we're working on that right there. So thank you for that. I uh, wanted to remind you that Dia de los Muertos is coming up here at the end of the month, of course. Uh, and we, it is our tradition to do a little ofrenda right here in the church. So we just ask you uh, to bring uh, photos of your loved ones who have died uh, for that ofrenda. And uh, we're going to celebrate All Saints Day uh, on uh, November 7th here. Uh, and, but we'll have it up before then so that you can, you can bring in photos anytime, okay? And we'll, we'll get them on there. And there's a story about that on page 29. So look at this. We're just so covered in the bulletin today. Um, I, uh, we, ha we do have a baptism happening on November 7th. Our baby twins are getting baptized. Uh, Lou and Sam, uh, Eddie and Allison Latham Jones's uh, children. Uh, but that is happening at the 745 service on November 7th. So if you want to see that baptism, that's what you have to do. They, they really wanted to do it at 745 because they said the 745 people get gypped out of everything. So, so they really wanted to do that. So I'm, I'm grateful to Eddie and Allison for that. So, uh, so that's great. All right. Um, uh, a bit of difficult stuff. I think most of you saw uh, our release on Laura Rodriguez. Um, Laura Rodriguez was uh, a member of this parish for several years and uh, you uh, probably remember Laura by the veils that she wore in church all the time. That's how we all recognized her. Uh, Laura was a beautiful young woman who was a lay reader for us and many other things. And she died in a car accident on Mount Lemon last uh, Sunday. So um, the, if, if there's any redeeming news in this, it's that her two-year-old daughter, who she just worshipped and took care of like nothing, was thrown from the car just as it went over the hill. So she suffered only minor physical injuries. Um, but obviously the emotional trauma that she's suffering is going to be great. Um, I'll just let you know that the family has, has all come from all parts of, uh, of the states and we've had some great conversations and been able to talk through things. Laura's service will be tomorrow at 4 p.m. I ask any of you who can participate live, it will be a great gift to the family, even if you didn't know Laura, um, to, to be here for that. Um, but we'll also be live streaming it, so um, please keep that family in your prayers. This is going to be an extremely difficult time for them, and there are lots of complications in this. 
not the least of which I will share with you is that she named me executor of her will without me knowing that. So there's lots of complications here and we'll work all those out, but the family's been just lovely and the really good news is, is that um, little Emma is with part of the family now and will be as we go through all the, all the other work there. So um, thank you all for that and please keep them in your prayers. And just uh, so you're all aware, Sandra Sankey also died um, on Friday. So please keep Lee uh, in your prayers too, and we'll let you know about, uh, about when we're going to do the service for, for Sandra, okay? But Lars is tomorrow, 4 p.m. All right, convention. As you know, uh, some of us have just returned from the, uh, from the, we'll call it the fun part of diocesan convention. Uh, we were up there <clears throat> Friday and yesterday, and uh, the presiding bishop was with us, uh, which was really, really fantastic. Um, I want to commend to all of you the Eucharist from yesterday. If you have not seen it yet, um, I will tell you it is the best diocesan-led Eucharist that I have experienced in my 10 years in this diocese. It was, it was just utterly fantastic. There was a mariachi band, there was a gospel choir, there was a conglomerate choir of all of our churches, um, there was uh, indigenous drumming. It was just, I mean, they, they, they captured everything and they started to use prayers beyond the prayer book in that service for the first time. So, see, we are making a difference in the diocese. So, um, so that's a, a great thing. So if you haven't seen it, check it out. It's really, really lovely. And you don't want to miss the presiding bishop's sermon. He was, the, the, he was just dead on in the Eucharist. It was just fantastic. So, um, so check that out. And then one other quick thing. Steve Streeter um, just told me that we could definitely use a couple more ushers. So if any of you think that you may be called to that ministry, it's really easy, especially during this time when we don't even take up offerings. There's not much to it at all. Um, please talk to Steve or, te or tell me that you might be interested and we'll get you hooked up. Uh, just, if we just had two or three more people, it would be really great. So I just throw that out for your consideration too. We are so happy you are here on this third Sunday of creation. Take it all in.
the first law of our being is that we are set in a delicate network of interdependence with our fellow human beings and with the rest of God's creation. Blessed are you, O God, the wilderness reveals the touch of your hand. The mountains declare your presence with us. May Christ be a pillar of fire by night. That leads us beyond the power struggles of our past. Frees us from prejudice and makes us ready. To receive the extravagant offer of your grace. May God be with you. 
and also with you. Let us pray. Holy God, your mercy is over all your works, and in the web of life, each creature has its role and place. We praise you for ocelot and owl, cactus and kelp, lichen and whale. We honor you for whirlwind and lava, tide and topsoil, cliff and marsh. Give us hearts and minds eager to care for your planet, humility to recognize all creatures as your beloved ones, justice to share the resources of the earth with all its inhabitants, and love not limited by our ignorance. This we pray in the name of Jesus, who unifies what is far off and what is near, and in whom, by grace and the working of your Holy Spirit, all things are knit together. Amen. Amen. A reading from the continuing revelation of God. The world, we are told, was made especially for man, a presumption not supported by all the facts. They have precise dogmatic insight of the intentions of the Creator, and it's hardly possible to be guilty of irreverence in speaking of their God any more than of heathen idols. How about those man-eating animals Lions, tigers, alligators, which smack their lips over raw man. Or about those myriads of noxious insects that destroy labor and drink his blood. It never seems to occur to these far-seeing teachers that nature's object in making animals and plants might possibly be, first of all, the happiness of each one of them, not the creation of all for the happiness of one. Why should man value himself as more than a small part of the one great unit of creation? And what creature of all that the Lord has taken the pains to make is not essential to the completeness of the unit, the cosmos? The universe would be incomplete without man, but it would also be incomplete without the smallest, trans-microscopic teacher that dwells beyond our conceited eyes and knowledge. From the dust of the earth, from the common elementary fund, the Creator has made Homo sapiens. From the same material, He has made every creature. They are earthborn companions and our fellow mortals.
the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory Glory to you, O Christ. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one on your right hand and one on your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. You are able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and with the baptism by which I am baptized you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers, lord it over them, and the great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you, But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be a slave of all. For the Son of of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. All right, I'm not pulling a Bishop Curry on you. I'm going back into that pulpit as soon as I do this, okay? So don't get nervous, okay? This is my favorite shirt that I own. Everybody can be great because anybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and verb agree to serve. You only need a heart full of grace a soul generated by love. Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Please be seated. Okay, I need to start with the collect. So, I tricked myself here. Uh, so this collect that we just did, the, um, the Ocelot and Al collect, as I like to call it, um, I, I wrote this with the Season of Creation subcommittee years ago, 2006, I think. And, um, and I had two major uh, things that I wanted changed in this, and daggone it if they didn't switch one of them back on me. And, and now it's in the, in the Book of Occasional Services. So, in the fourth line there, justice to share the resources of the earth. I beg them to change that to wonders of the earth. And it got changed to wonders, but somehow when the book came out, it went back to that version. So, I, I, and I said it out loud without catching it, so I need to say to you, that's not what this prayer was supposed to be, and and we fixed it, so there you go. All right. I'm really not sure why this is so difficult to comprehend. He was born in a backwater town as far away from the power structures of the day as possible. That birth takes place not in a house, but a barn. He is wrapped in rags and placed in an animal trough. His father is a blue-collar worker. His mother is an out-of-wedlock pregnant teenager. His first visitors are the lowest class in that society, sheepherders. 
He grows up and lives in total obscurity until he is 30. Then he surrounds himself with more social losers, this time fishermen. He gets invited to stay in the best homes, but instead, what does he do? He hangs around with tax collectors and prostitutes. Rather than be with the social, political, and religious elite, all of whom have given him the opportunity to be one of them, he chooses instead to hook up with the ultimate losers, children, women, and substance farmers. The week before he is killed, the power structure honors its leaders with a magnificent, gigantic parade down the center of town. Their royal leaders mounted on magnificent stallions, surrounded by military might. Simultaneously, he gets on an ass and rides down a dirt path on the seedy side of town, deliberately satirizing the empire's approach to leadership. He is cheered on by the ostracized, who wave dirty palm branches that they've picked up off the desert floor, mocking the power parade that has people tossing flowers on their despotic rulers from overhanging balconies. Then, right before he dies, as a symbol representing all of it, he gets down on his hands and knees and washes the feet of his lowly disciples. Every aspect of Jesus' life, from a birth below humble to the humiliating cross, cries out in protest against humanity's understanding of glory and grandeur. And today, Jesus states in succinct words what he has been trying to teach by example his entire life. Whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. But somehow, somehow the bonehead disciples seem to have missed the entire life and breadth of Jesus' ministry. It seems unimaginable that after being with him every day, anyone could ask to share in Jesus' power. What power? What in the world do they think they are going to share? And of course, it is not just James and John that seem to have missed everything that Jesus showed them and taught them, the other disciples immediately jump on the same bandwagon, getting concerned that they are going to miss out on getting chosen for the Jesus cabinet when he becomes ruler of the world. The question posed not just by us, but by scholars for generations has been, how could the disciples in Mark's gospel have been so stupid? Yeah, how could they? Thank God that in today's church, we are not obtuse like them. <laughs> we have built a church that mirrors the servant leadership taught to us by Jesus, haven't we? A church where there are no power struggles. I love the bishop talking about that yesterday. <laughs> where there is no hierarchy, where all of our bush bishops look and act just like deacons, don't they? And where our priests never try to climb corporate ladders. We have no segregation, no homophobia, no class structure, no gender inequality. We are in an, in an egalitarian relationship with each other and the entire created order, right? Yeah. Despite Jesus' devotion to servanthood, despite his lifelong push to bring us into that equal relationship with each other, James and John completely missed the boat. And we, with all the benefits of hindsight, have followed directly in the footsteps of the Zebedee boys. We invented a church system that not only was hierarchical, that not only was run by bishops, often with an iron fist, but one that created a polity where one particular bishop has absolute and unequivocal power over all the other clergy and all the lay people. 
a bishop who, when speaking to the church from his high and mighty chair, is declared to be infallible, a human being. We are so much like James and John that we literally appointed someone to sit on God's right hand. We are so arrogant that when a scientist named Copernicus discovered that the earth revolved around the sun, the church kicked him out because, of course, humanity must be the center of the universe. When people were not members of this domineering faith, we killed them or we made them subservient slaves because they were less than us. When the Protestant Reformation finally occurred, someone stood up in opposition to the power-laden papal legacy, but what they did was take his power and give it to a book, saying that the book that people wrote was infallible. We are so egotistical that, as John Muir pointed out in today's first reading, great job with that, Martha, we believe that God created all of the millions of different inhabitants of the planet, not for themselves, but to make one species happy. Today, we continue in every way to celebrate the human species as the dominator of the universe. I'm going to call it Zebedee Syndrome. <laughs> we now believe we are so exceptional that we have named an entire geological epoch after ourselves. Though humanity's moment on Earth has not even been this blip in time compared to the billions of years of every other age, we have self-centeredly called this nanosecond in history the Anthropocene Epoch, the age of humankind, the period where humans have dominance over the chemical, biological, and geological processes of the Earth. Seriously? Jesus' response to James and John is as important as any statement he ever made. He knew darn well that the utter conceit of human beings, our constant quest for power and domination, would create untold suffering. Because we have continued to believe that we are better than everything and everyone else, because we continue to revel in human exceptionalism, we have built border walls to keep others away from us. We invented segregation to keep those lowlifes away from us. We created racism, sexism, classism, all the isms, so that we can always lord it over others. But I am not sure that even Jesus realized just how destructive our rejection of his words would be 2,000 years after he said them. Today, our puffed-up views of our tiny selves have taken us to the edge of annihilation. I want to show you what I mean. So come with me on a little visit. We have been driving for five and a half hours. The sun is long gone. The traffic is horrendously horrendous, but we are almost there. The instructions to our destination are cryptic, is that the road? Nope. Is that it? Nope. But then we find it. Despite the horns blaring at us as we slow down enough to see it, we drive a hundred feet to a ridge, dip over it, and suddenly the mass of chaos is all but gone. We find another hill, park at the top, and the sound of the human world disappears. We inch our way in the darkness, searching for a trail in a frenzy of ice plants and wildflowers. We gingerly make our way down a steep precipice, still wondering if we are in the right place. It is dark as coal, but now we hear it. There's water crashing directly below us. After three wrong turns, we are standing on a slanting porch of a ramshackled house. Gosh, that is such a cool house. The key hits the lock, turns, and yes, the door opens. 
Only then are we sure we're in the right place. The place is big, old, and showing its age. But the bed feels like heaven, and the ocean is a hundred feet in front of us. The next morning, just after dawn, I am up to see what was invisible when we arrived. I step onto the long sandy beach. To the north is a rock outcropping over a mile away, no buildings. To the south, I see a tide pool and a cove with tiny cottages. In a couple hours, this beach will be littered with humans. But right now, there is not one person as far as I can see in either direction. I head north finding a waterfall off the cliff where we had walked down last, the night before. But then, then it happens. A hundred yards in front of me, I see the water part like in a Cecil B. DeMille production. And then this gigantic mass of mammal breaks the surface. The prodigious body jumps up at a 120 degree angle out of the water. He reaches the apex of his leap and seems to just hang in midair before gravity finally pulls him back down to the ocean surface. The splash reverberates across the ocean for a quarter mile. I look again. Did I really just see that? A gigantic gray whale had just breached right in front of me. I have never seen a gray whale breach before that day or after it. Some humpbacks, yes, but never a gray. I looked up the beach, no one. I looked down the beach, no one. I looked out on the water, no boats. A gray whale just breached, and no human in the world saw it, except me. This morning, that beach contains nothing. Nothing but the smell of death. Two Sundays ago, as we celebrated Creation Sunday, a pipe ruptured on a rig a half mile offshore, that beach was and is inundated with oil, killing all the wildlife in its wake. An ocean healthy enough to support hundreds of dolphins, thousands of tide pool animals, clams, oysters, thousands of fish, humpback whales, and that beautiful, amazing gray whale and his family and friends. All of them were slaughtered because of Zebedee syndrome. All of them are dead because we have the hubris to drill for viscous oil in the ocean itself, even though we still have zero idea how to get the awful stuff out of the water if an accident happens. We don't have a clue yet. We do it because we believe we are so exceptional that we are one step from God. We do it because not only do we believe it would be beneath us to serve the creatures of the world as Jesus teaches us today, we believe it is our right to treat them as objects there for our use and abuse. We do it because we believe we are the ones who should be served and we are the ones who should be sitting next to God. As we continue to see ourselves as more important than all the other species on earth, as we continue to ask God to put us in the place of privilege, as we continue to forget Jesus' words about lording it over others, the world suffers at our hand. But now, scientists are pointing out that our hubris is coming back to bite us. We have intensified agriculture, expanded infrastructure, and extracted resources, here we go again, at the expense of our wild spaces. United Nations Environment Program Executive Director Inger Anderson said, 
The science is clear that if we keep exploiting wildlife and destroying our ecosystems, then we can expect to see a steady stream of these diseases jumping from animals to humans in the years ahead. By not following the call of Jesus, by not being a servant to all, this is the world we have created. A place where four and a half million people have died, where 220 million have been sick, a world that has emotionally af deeply affected billions, where we can only come together as a community again because of vaccines and masks. So why is the answer to our dilemma? This one really is simple, folks. All we need to do is pay attention to the questions asked in today's gospel. What do James and John ask of Jesus? Do this for us. Grant us this. I heard some of you laughing as that gospel went out. You can't help yourself. And what is Jesus' question back to them? What can I do for you? That's it. Jesus' question holds the key for humanity. Empires destroy because their goal is always power over. The way to take down empire is to insist on the servant leadership of Jesus in every organization in the whole world, from countries to churches to clubs to families, we need to put an end once and for all to the so-called family values notion that says that a father is the ultimate authority figure in a household. That is the beginning of the power over hierarchy system that Jesus throws out today. Next are bullies in schools. Bullies lead to despots. We must tolerate we must not tolerate their behavior on any level, on any level. Whether they are power over Cub Scout leaders, tyrannical softball coaches, or gun-happy killers of squirrels in the park, we need to stop turning a blind eye. We have to address them every time their behavior must be stopped. If we just do that, if we stop allowing autocrats to be in charge of anything, oppression will end. When all of us begin by asking, what can I do for you? Segregation dies. When we truly believe the aborigine is our sister, suppression of the other can't exist. When we serve that ocelot as part of the web of life, we heal the planet, we reverse climate change, and we prevent zoonotic diseases. When we actually begin to believe that all of us are equal, the moss and the mountain lion, the hummingbird and the human, we will reverse this destruction. When our theology reflects that the body of Christ metaphor is not just about humanity, but all of creation, that saves the world. The only way that body operates is when everyone does their part in the system, where no one is more or less important than anyone or anything else. Beloved, this is not some pie-in-the-sky dream. This change in worldview is achievable. But to do so, not only must all of us be servants to one another, but we must also resist every form of autocracy everywhere we see it. We need to reject every church structure that in any way separates laity from clergy. That's the opposite of who we are. We need to remember that elected people are not gods, but are our servants to do our will. We need to reject any structure that does not hold up all nations as equal participants in the world stage. We need to eliminate tyranny and power over politics wherever it exists in our world. 
by wiping it out before it can fester in its cancerous pattern, we will create the kingdom that Jesus envisions. A place where each of us will be recognized for our greatness as we serve each other and bring equality to each other, knocking down every wall that divides us and creating a world where all of us are affirmed and loved. Now, I get it. In the present state of the planet, it is all but impossible to not feel helpless and hopeless. But if we do nothing more than live into Jesus' words today, if we can make despotism a thing of the past, the brokenness we are experiencing is all going to go away. It is, of course, not easy to make this kind of paradigm shift. But it is simple. In the world that Jesus envisions, every single one of us, the lichen and the lion, will be recognized as an integral part of the body of Christ. All of us will be great. No more despots, beloved. Only servants who care for everyone and every aspect of God's creation. Let us say together the affirmation of faith found on page, top of page 10. You are God, not me, not us. Help me need to remember the simple fact each day. You are the center of creation, not me, not us. Help me to recognize my place within the orbit of your grace. You are the source of all life, not me, not us. Let me find you kinship with all creation. Amen. Creator God, architect of the universe, we gather to praise your holy name and give thanks for all of your creation and our place in it. Majestic mountains point our hearts and minds upward to your splendor. You bless us with peace and grace that flow like your rivers. Like the flowers bursting with blooms, we too can glorify your name. Like your love and kindness, the twinkling stars and blazing sun give us warmth and light for the journey. For these and all of the other blessings of creation, we thank you. Give, give us, us grace to, to learn, learn lessons, lessons from, from nature. nature. In speaking your word and truth, help the church be like the determined and single-minded salmon struggling upstream against the current. This week, we pray for the animals and humans of the Yukon watershed where salmon are running at one-tenth of their previous levels. God, who is with us in all creation, give, give us, us grace to swim upstream. upstream. When we gather to form nations, cities, and governments, help those in high places and all of us learn from the small ants that teach us to replace greed and exploitation with community, teamwork, responsibility, and diligence. This week we give thanks that for the first time a U.S. president recognized Indigenous Peoples Day. God who is with us in all creation, give us grace to live in harmony with each other. 
We thank you for the creatures that are irritants to us, <laughs> reminding us that challenges and conflicts are part of life. This week we pray that the remaining nations who have not signed on to the global pledge to cut methane emissions by 2030 will do so this week. God who is with us in all creation, give us grace to live life with passion and joy. Give us the wisdom to see that our hearts can be like the fire, sending sparks out into the world as light and warmth for others. This week, we pray for the sea inhabitants of Southern California and an end to oil spills. God who is with us in all creation, give us grace to kindle our hearts with your love. Comfort us with the lessons from seeds we are born, we grow, we bloom, we die, and we are born again. This week, we remember Laura Rodriguez, Anna Greta Christensen, Cricket Kelbau, and the Reverend Bill Young. So pray for Sandra Sankey. Mm -hmm. God, who is with us in all creation, give, give us, us grace, grace to believe in our, our own resurrection. resurrection the unconditional affection for our companion animals teaches us to cherish and love each other. God, who is with us in all creation, give us grace to take time for fellowship and friendships. Creator God, you make all things and weave them together in an intricate tapestry of life. Teach us to respect the fragile balance of life and to care for all the gifts of your creation. Guide us by your wisdom that by the decisions we make, life may be cherished and a good and fruitful earth may continue to show your glory and sing your praises. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God, our neighbors, and God's creation. Holy, Holy and, and merciful, merciful God, we confess that we have failed to honor you by rightly claiming our kinship with all your creatures. We have walked heavily on your earth, overused and wasted its diversity, taken for granted its beauty and abundance, and treated its inhabitants unjustly, holding future generations hostage to our greed. Have mercy on us and forgive us our sin. Renew in us the resolve to keep and preserve your earth as you desire and intend, with grateful and compassionate hearts, through your Son, our Teacher, Jesus Christ. Amen. May the God of creation pardon us for the sins that we heap upon God's earth, our island home. May the Creator refresh us and renew us with love and guide us again to see all of the cosmos as our kin. Give us the strength to protect all of God's world as a mother protects her children. And may the blessing of Grandfather Creator, Christ Liberator, and Spirit Sister be upon us and all of the cosmos. Amen. Amen. La paz de Cristo sea siempre con ustedes. Let us offer one another a sign of peace.
Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who live in it. Giver of life, receive all we offer you this day. Let the Spirit bestow on your church. Continue to work in the world through our hearts. Amen. Thank you. 
God is with us. God is present here. Rejoice, lift up your hearts. We lift our hearts to the Most High. Let us give thanks to the Holy One. It is right to offer thanks and praise. We praise you and we bless you, gracious Creator, source of all life. In the beginning, you sang all things into being, earth and sky, mountains and waters, and every living creature in the four directions. You made us in your image and taught us to walk in harmony, but we rebelled against you and wandered away. And yet, as a mother cares for her children, you would not forget us. Again and again, you called us to live the good life with you, with the creation and with each other. And so this day, we join with saints and angels and all the holy people in a song of praise, lifting our voices to honor you as we sing. Praise to you, Creator God, to deliver us from the power of sin and death and to show us all your gifts. You came to Mary and gave her a son, Jesus, the holy child of God. Living Living among among us, Jesus Jesus loved loved us. He He ate ate with outcasts and sinners, healed the sick, and and told the poor about God's love. He wanted all the world to walk in beauty, beauty, yet we failed to follow him. Then the time came for him to complete upon the cross the gift of his life and to be glorified by you. On the night before he died for us, Jesus was at table with his friends. He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. Again, he gave thanks to you, gave it to them, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Now gathered at your table, Creator God, and remembering Christ crucified and risen, we offer to you our gifts of bread and wine and ourselves. Send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the body and blood of Christ. Breathe your Spirit over the whole earth and make us your new creation, the body of Christ given for the world you have made. In the fullness of time, bring us with all your saints from every tribe and language and people and nation to feast at the banquet prepared from the creation of the world. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen. Oremos como nuestro Salvador Cristo nos enseñó. Padre nuestro, que estás en el cielo, santificado sea tu nombre. Venga tu reino, hágase tu voluntad, 
en la tierra como en el cielo. Danos hoy nuestro pan de cada día. Perdona nuestras ofensas, como también nosotros perdonamos a los que nos ofenden. No nos dejes caer en tentación y líbranos del mal, porque tuyo es el reino, tuyo es el poder y tuya es la gloria, ahora y por siempre. Amén. Alleluia, be known to us, risen Christ, in the breaking of the bread. The bread, the bread which we break makes all of us one with you. Alleluia. Beloved, this is the body of Christ for the body of Christ. Be what you see, receive what you are.
Let us pray. Creator God, breathing, breathing your own life, life into being. Thank, thank you for the gift of this communion. communion. Thank, thank you for the gift of this life. Thank, thank you for placing us on this earth with its minerals and waters, flowers and fruits, the living creatures of grace and beauty. Thank you for giving us the care of the earth. Teach us, Teach us, creator God of love, of love through the mystery of this communion, that the earth and all its fullness is yours, the world and all who dwell in it. Call us yet again to safeguard the gift of life. Amen. Beloved, be careful as you go out into God's creation, for it does not belong to you. Be careful with one another and with yourself, for you are the dwelling place of the Most High. Be alert and be silent, for sometimes God is but a whisper. And may the blessing of that God, creator, liberator, and sustainer, be with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Go now, protect and celebrate creation, welcome wildness, embrace earth, revel in God's wonder present in the desert, the ocean, and the forest. Then bring the world, the love of wilderness to all the world. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. <laughs>